Hi everyone, welcome to this AP Environmental Science lecture on mass extinctions. So the learning objectives for this, you will see that they are my own. AP does not have a topic number or learning objectives for mass extinctions, but I think that understanding mass extinctions is crucial for this class because understanding the past is the key to understanding the present, okay? Or to at least have an allegory for what's happening in the present or an analogy. So climate changes throughout Earth's history, uh, that is one of the AP learning objectives, and you will see that a lot here, and that is due to both geological and biological factors. Changes in climate often result in a mass extinction. The one gas that you will see um, that changes a lot and is implicated in a lot of mass extinctions is CO2. Okay, so that might have, um, might come up today, right? Um, there have been five mass extinctions in our history, and we are possibly in the sixth one now. We'll talk about that. Um, and there's been mi many minor extinction events. And as species go extinct, they leave unoccupied niches for the surviving groups to diversify into. So one of the key things is that life does go on. We're going to start this off with the geologic time scale. Um, that you'll notice that this is the same poster that's on my classroom wall. So geologic time scale is divided into um, eons, epochs, ages, uh, periods, all of these different um, divisions, and you guys do not need to know those. You don't need to know how long each one is. You don't need to know the order of them, but there are some that you probably recognize, such as um, Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous, um, you know, the Cambrian for the Cambrian explosion, the one that we're in right now, which is the Holocene, which is very tiny right up here. We may actually be past that and into what we call the Anthropocene, but you don't need to know all of this, but I will be referencing it. OK, so you may jump back to the slide just to get yourself a um, a, you know, kind of a baseline of where we're talking about. If I say the end Ordovician extinction event where we're talking about. But one thing that I want to point out on this slide is that Earth began about six, uh, four point six billion years ago. So four point six billion years ago. The earliest fossil evidence that we have for life is about three point seven billion years ago. The um, most people agree that life probably emerged around 4.0 billion years ago, and I've seen numbers as far back as 4.2 or even 4.3 billion years ago um, when life maybe first emerged. So conservative estimate about 4.0 and then um, kind of pushing the boundary maybe about 4.2, 4.4 billion years ago. Okay. Um, Back then, the Earth was very different. We'll see that on the next slide. And the first life to evolve were prokaryotes, right? prokaryotic, bacteria, archaea. And then eukaryotes evolved much later. Okay. The atmosphere is going to be very important for this entire lecture. So let's talk about the atmosphere a little bit. The atmospheric composition has changed a lot in Earth's history. Um, when the planet first formed about 4.6 billion years ago, the atmosphere was primarily ammonia and methane, very high concentrations of ammonia and methane, also hydrogen and helium. And then you get water vapor spiking about 4 billion years ago before it all rains into and forms the Earth's oceans as the planet cools. The ones that I want you to pay attention to are carbon dioxide and oxygen. Okay, so carbon dioxide you see in these two colors, the light blue and the yellow and then oxygen in the, in, the, in the various shades of green, okay? Notice that carbon dioxide was very high, over 25%, uh, maybe close to 30, 33% at, at its peak in the Archean, okay? And then oxygen started to emerge. Oxygen was not on the early Earth, or at least diatomic oxygen gas was not on the early Earth. Oxygen is very prevalent, right? There's oxygen in carbon dioxide, there's oxygen in water, but oxygen gas, O2, was um, absent on the early Earth. It wasn't until photosynthetic organisms evolved that started producing oxygen that we get oxygen in the atmosphere. We'll come back to photosynthesis and oxygen in a little bit, but first let's talk about extinction. Um, species are constantly evolving diversifying and going extinct. Okay, species will just constantly be going extinct on the planet. It's a totally normal and natural process. Okay, the background extinction rate is that rate at which they are supposed to be going, or maybe not supposed to, but um, do go extinct just as a function of biology and a function of geology. Okay, and it's not influenced by human activity. And 
the lifetime um, of a species, the average lifetime of a species, which is in this diagram or this uh, graphic, this um, chart, is different for different uh, classes of organisms. So let's take mammals, for example. Mammals, the average lifespan of a species is about 1 million years. So a species will diversify and emerge you know, through the process of evolution from ancestral species, and it will stick around on the planet for about a million years. Okay, And then it will either go extinct outright and live no living descendants, or it will diversify into something else over that time frame and then be um, categorized as a different species by the end of that period, Okay, by the end of that million years. And that's just on average. Um, so you can see Cenozoic mammals, one to two million years on average. Um, dinoflagellates, though, a single species exists on the planet for about 13 million years. So maybe the rate of evolution is a little bit slower for these guys. Maybe they fit into their niche a little bit better and they uh, more so dominate that niche and there's no reason to evolve or the um, selective pressure is to stay as is. But they're a single species on average is on the planet for about 13 million years for a dinoflagellate. Okay, and you can see some of the other examples on the chart. So that's an extinction, and extinction is just, um, again, when a species has no living representatives on the planet. A mass extinction, though, is when there is a significantly higher extinction rate, and within a small region of geologic time, that could be a few million years, that's a blink in the eye in geologic time, over 66 or two thirds, 66 percent or two thirds of the species on the planet go extinct. Okay, there's been five mass extinctions since the history of animal life, and we refer to those as the Big Five. There were possibly others before animals um, evolved during the Ediacaran, Ediac, Ediacaran period, um, and we'll talk about one of those in a second. Again, referencing um, photosynthetic bacteria and uh, oxygen. But those big five extinction events, again, when 66% of the species on the planet at least go extinct, are the end Ordovician, the late Devonian, the end Permian, the end Triassic, and the end Cretaceous. Okay, and you can see the spikes on this graph. Now, this graph isn't showing um, species that are going extinct, it's showing genera, so genuses that are going extinct. So you can look at um, families, you can look at um, you know, genuses or genera, species, um, really any taxonomic category. Now, although this lecture may be a little bit heavy um, in terms of, uh, you know, oh, it's really sad that species go extinct, there is an upside. This opens many niches for new species to um, arise and occupy. So, for example, the only reason that the mammals are dominating the planet right now um, unless you ask a insect person in which they would say that insects, specifically ants and termites, are dam dominating the planet. But we'll say that mammals are dominating the planet right now, and the only reason for that is because there was a mass extinction event 65 million years ago, um, or 66 million years ago at the end of the Cretaceous that wiped out the non-avian dinosaurs. So without that extinction event, we would still be um, tiny little mammals at the feet of the dinosaurs coming out primarily at night. Now there's some common threads for mass extinctions, some common causes for mass extinctions. And I say for extinction, mass or otherwise, what I mean is a minor extinction event. And that's just um, when less than two thirds of the species go extinct. So species are going um, extinct all the time. That is the ba normal background extinction event, but there's many minor extinctions um, throughout the Earth's history and, you know, we're not really going to talk about those today, but they typically divide out um, periods or you know eons or anything else that um, they typically will mark a stage in geologic time, transferring from one dominant um, group of species to another dominant group of species. But anyway, there's many minor extinction events. That's why I mean up there. Um, the first is sea level change, then climate change. That should probably actually be the one that you star. Oceanographic changes, the most important one here is water circulation, ocean activity, or sorry, ocean chemistry. Volcanic activity you'll see is huge here, and that typically does lead to um, climate change, and then a meteor impact. That will also lead to a climate change. And then climate change is going to lead to sea levels changing. It's going to lead to oceanographic changes. Um, 
so really climate change is at the center of this. If we were to draw this as a web rather than a list, climate change would be at the center. So starting off the extinctions, I'm going to start with one before animals. So um, back in the Archean or maybe even the Proterozoic, about 2.4 billion years ago, right at this junction between the two, there was what they call the Great Oxidation Event. Now this is not part of the Big Five because remember that the Big Five only references animal life. And it's a lot easier to, to just look at animal life because animals make great fossils and bacteria don't make great fossils at all most of the time. Um, so what happened? Before, um, before this event, let's say at the very beginning of life, all life was anaerobic, okay? Meaning that, th that they did not use oxygen. No oxygen gas present in the early atmosphere. Notice that oxygen is not present in the Hadean, the Archean. And again, that is O2. Um, oxygen didn't start to be produced until photosynthesis evolved around 2.4 billion years ago, or maybe even as far back as 3 billion um, or 3.3 billion years ago. I've seen different estimates on all of that. So again, unclear when photosynthesis evolved, but around that time, photosynthesis started to um, evolve. Okay, the first photosynthesizers were uh, photosynthetic bacteria, cyanobacteria, such as the ones that are still on the planet that are shown here. Okay, essentially before that, chemosynthesis was the only way that organisms uh, fueled their metabolism. All organisms on the planet were prokaryotic at the time. They were all bacteria or archaea, and they all did chemosynthesis, or they were consumers of other bacteria that did chemosynthesis. Okay, and then these clever little bacteria figured out that they could, or I'm obviously personifying them, and it was a natural selective evolutionary process, but they started to photosynthesize. They moved closer to the surface of the ocean and um, were exposed to sunlight and started to photosynthesize. And there's many theories about how they were able to do that, but I'm not going to bore you with those details. So they started to photosynthesize. Remember that oxygen gas is a um, product of photosynthesis, and they started to produce oxygen gas. Oxygen gas is highly reactive. And what it first started to react with were minerals around the planet, um, specifically iron, but a lot of other minerals as well. And you get what these what they're called these banded iron formations where the iron on the planet before this was all, um, that was deposited was all um, gray steel looking iron. And then after it was all rust colored. And then you get these bands of rust versus steel versus rust versus steel. When I say steel, I mean steel colored, kind of like this um, silvery grayish blue color. And you get these bands of red iron in between them, and it um, just shows oxygen in the atmosphere, then the oxygen level goes down, and then it goes back up. Um, it fluctuated. Okay, so these banded iron formations um, was what, or the iron on the planet is what. Um, the oxygen first started reacting with and then it started to accumulate in the atmosphere and by extension also um, dissolving into water and accumulating in the oceans and oxygen again is very reactive and it reacts with living tissues and it probably led to the extinction of most bacterial species on the planet because oxygen is very toxic to most anaerobic bacteria bacteria had to evolve to um, to tolerate oxygen and then to use oxygen. So cellular respiration, aerobic cellular respiration, I should say, um, evolved after this time as well. Or at least um, that's, th that's how the thinking goes. Okay, so oxygen in the atmosphere, highly reactive, reacted with living tissues, caused the, um, caused the, the first bacterial um, generation on the planet or the first bacterial um, groups of organisms to go extinct. All right, so let's, go into the more fun ones, the big five. So again, the big five um, are the end Ordovician, the end Devonian, the end Permian, the Triassic Jurassic, and the um, Cretaceous Paleogene. So the more bold lines on this diagram. You see some of the, um, some of the um, indicators, uh, indicator fossils, index fossils, sorry, that's the word I'm looking for. Some of the index fossils 
for those times and the way that they change um, afterwards. And then you see number of marine families. So we're looking at families, another taxonomic group here, rather than species, and marine families increasing, increasing over time until you hit the end Ordovician where they plummet. And then again, recover, increase, maybe a small minor extinction event, and then plummet, et cetera. Okay. All right. So at this stage, I should probably point out that um, you guys do not need to know the time frames of any of these. You don't really need to know. You don't need to know the species that went extinct, how many of them, what they were, uh, the percentage, anything like that. You don't even need to know the mechanism. But what you should be able to identify is some of those mechanisms um, and, and how they're happening today or analogs that are happening today or anything else that's applicable for our climate, such as what i right, sorry, applicable for our class. Um, such as weathering of rocks, which will drop CO2 levels because CO2 will react with those rocks that are weathering and, um, and uh, form inorganic um, limestones in some cases, but inorganic rock that contains carbon. Okay, You don't really need to know the mechanism for these. So during the end or division extinction event, animal life um, had existed on the planet since the Cambrian um, about five and a half um, million years ago. So complex life was well on its way and animals were all around the planet in the oceans primarily. Um, I, sorry, not even primarily. Animals were just in the oceans, my bad. Um, life was in the oceans, okay? There probably was bacterial um, colonizers on the land, but no um, animals, okay? Uh, there was a drop in CO2 because of weathering of the young Appalachians. The Appalachians are right here in this diagram, you notice that they're near the equator, they're getting, or at least in the tropics, the southern tropics, they're getting lots of rain, and the Appalachians were just formed, and they are weathering down. So the Appalachian mountains um, are, in fact, that old, very old mountain range, and they're still weathering down. But this was really rapid weathering because they're right on the, um, on the equator, lots of rain, and they're not covered by plants, so the rock can weather really easily and that CO2 would therefore plummet, okay? That in combination with mo 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 much of the land being around the south, um, south of the tropics in the southern hemisphere, close to the poles, led to global cooling and glacial event. What probably happened was a positive feedback loop where you have some of you know, the globe started to cool, and then you get some glaciers forming, which further cooled the planet through a couple mechanisms, especially the um, albedo effect. And then those glaciers advance and advance and advance until they cover the surface of the earth. Now, there is some um, debate about whether there was a band in the middle where there was no glaciers or whether um, it was slushy or what it was, but it was basically a snowball earth. Most life was confined to the shallow seas at that time. So notice all the shallow seas um, over here, all the shallow seas right here, and that's where much of life was confined to. Okay, As these glaciers were formed, sea level dropped really rapidly. And those organisms that couldn't migrate um, lower and lower as the waters receded would go extinct. And those cooling oceans also changed the temperature in those oceans, which led to oxygenation of those oceans. So recall that as you lower the temperature of water, more dissolved gases can go into that, including dissolved oxygen. The inverse is also true. So um, if you increase the temperature of water, then you'll have fewer dissolved gases. Okay. Um, that will become important as we move on into the other mass extinctions as well. So there is this inverse relationship between temperature and dissolved gases. So the oceans, which were hypoxic, meaning that they were low levels of oxygen, um, became very oxygenated, and that poisoned many anaerobic species as well, um, and continued that extinction event, disrupting food chains, all of that stuff. Then at the end of the Ordovician, there was this spike in CO2 levels, um, most likely due to volcanism, although we're not 100% sure right now. And that spike in CO2 levels warmed the planet rapidly, melted the glaciers rapidly, led to rapid sea level rise, and led to the, um, led to the, uh, the deoxygenation of the oceans. So any of those species that adapted to the snowball earth during about a million years um, 
was then doomed as everything became warm again. So it was kind of this one-two punch. First off, the planet cooled and the oceans became oxygenated and sea levels dropped and you had this um, glaciers covering the planet and then rapid warming afterwards through a massive spike in carbon dioxide, which then warmed the planet, massive sea level rise. If the species couldn't um, rise with the sea level, then they would go extinct. And then the deoxygenation of the, of the of the oceans, turning them hypoxic again. Not sure if we've seen that term hypoxic yet in class, um, but hypo basically means low and oxic obviously means oxygen. Okay. So that led to the extinction of about 86% of known species. Now I like to have these little uh, pictures afterwards so you can see an artist's rendition of what um, it was during the Ordovician and then right after the mass extinction event um, a few million years later into the Silurian. And notice that we have um, fishes evolving um, and you know some things that are maybe looking very familiar as well. So many things do survive and then unoccupied niches from things that go extinct are filled by other organisms, such as fishes in this example. So life recovers after the end Ordovician extinction event. You have maybe a minor extinction event here and there later um, until you get to the Devonian, which actually wasn't that far away from the end Ordovician. So about 90 million years later, okay? Um, so at the end of the Devonian, you again had this kind of one-two punch, but about 7, 75% of species went extinct. So about three quarters of all the species on the planet went extinct. For the mechanism for this one, um, plants had colonized the land by this time. You see that there is large swaths of green on the planet. And again, artist rendition. And plants evolved woody tissue. So they started to evolve woody tissue during the Devonian. And the average height of plants went from point, um, 0.3 meters, about 30 centimeters, to over 40 meters. Now these weren't technically trees in the strictest sense of the word, but they were essentially fern trees. Okay, by the end of the Devonian, we had fern tree forests. Um, plants were therefore moving, removing a ton of CO2 from the atmosphere to go into their biomass. So through photosynthesis, they were moving CO2 from the atmosphere um, and converting it into biomass. And some of that biomass is then getting locked in the soil as well. Plants will also mobilize soil. So think about their roots um, moving very, very slowly through the soil. They break it apart. They facilitate erosion. Erosion is going to um, cause a lot of nutrients from these organic rich uh, soils to go into the oceans. Okay, so you're going to have erosion of, um, of soil out into the oceans. Okay, the planet hadn't really had that much um, up until this point. Okay, that caused many algal blooms, eutrophication, and then the subsequent anoxia that comes with um, eutrophication. Plus, you have the CO2 levels being drawn down um, due to weathering, same thing as you had during the Ordovician. Okay, so because they're mobilizing soil, they can break it apart and um, help to weather it as well, not just erode it, and that's going to drop CO2 levels. Um, Erosion and photosynthesis are both going to cause global cooling, cause another slowball earth, but not the magnitude of the end Ordovician, and then that could have coincided with volcanism. So I should point out that the end Devonian, the late Devonian mass extinction event is one of the ones that we know the least about, uh, which is why that wasn't super detailed. Um, but you do see some of the species assemblies change. We uh, lose all the, um, the placoderms, the jawed um, armored fishes. Um, we have some um, lobe finned fishes and early um, early colon uh, vertebrate colonizers of land, the early amphibians, and then just moving into the Carboniferous, where we get the first um, amniotes, which is the um, the species that lay hard shelled eggs without having to have water. So moving into reptiles rather than amphibians, and then in the oceans we get sharks replacing the placoderms and their niche. So life was good for about a hundred million years until we get to the end of the Permian. The end of the Permian is um, when the mass, the, when the largest mass extinction event in Earth's history um, occurred. It's also called the Great Dying and about 96% of species went extinct. Now 
if there ever was a time on the planet when we came close to losing all animal life, this was it. Now, we're never really going to lose all bacterial life. Bacteria will continue to survive because they're found literally everywhere, including a mile deep um, into soils and rock, but pretty close to losing animal life, maybe even plant life as well. The mechanism was massive volcanism, and what you guys should know is that volcanoes do release a lot of CO2. And those volcanoes were in what is now Siberia, so we're looking up here on this map, and they're called the Siberian Traps. And a trap is a type of volcano that we haven't seen on um, erupting for about 66 million years, and it's flood basalts, and it's essentially continent-wide volcanism. So you have volcanoes that are covering basically an entire continent, okay? So think about that, and enough lava erupted to cover the contiguous United States, so the lower 48 with half a mile deep lava. In parts of Russia, parts of Siberia, that lava is two and a half miles deep. So that is a ton of lava. That's very, that's a huge amount of lava. If you think about driving from Maine down to California, like San Diego, and then driving north to Seattle, all the way down to Miami, the tip of Florida, we could cover the entire lower 48 of the United States with half a mile of lava. That is insane amount of lava. So a huge amount of CO2 is being released and other noxious gases as well. And what they think also may have happened is that those that volcanism went through large deposits of coal, oil, and natural gas. So you, as the magma rises up, um, it will encounter those fossil fuels and ignite them and release all the carbon dioxide from those sources into the atmosphere as well. So we had massive, massive, massive warming. We had hothouse earth instead of the snowball earth that we had in the previous one. Um, magma also went through thick salt deposits, which um, essentially just evaporated them, it volatized them, and they would react with stratospheric ozone. So the salts that went up into the atmosphere would react with stratospheric ozone, reduce the ozone layer, and the ozone layer's um, job is to, um, or what it does is block harmful ultraviolet light from getting to the surface of the planet. So by destroying the ozone layer, it let in very harmful mutagenic ultraviolet radiation. This is a mutagen, also, as well as a carcinogen, um, and it will mutate DNA. So it can definitely lead to extinction of um, species as well. Increased CO2 acidified the oceans, which may have been the biggest killer. The biggest, um, like the biggest losses that we saw during this period were in the oceans. Okay. And then you have the atmospheric sulfur. So you have elevated hydrogen sulfide levels in the oceans as well. So not only are the oceans becoming um, warmer, they're becoming more acidic, they're losing their dissolved oxygen, but they are also gaining hydrogen sulfide, which is very toxic. Hydrogen sulfide is basically what's in rotten eggs and gives them that rotten egg smell. Okay, and one last thing to point out, this was during the time of Pangaea. So if you guys recall our Pangaea discussion and our Pangaea activity, this was happening um, when Pangaea was uh, the supercontinent at the time. All right, so 96% of species going extinct. So some art artist renditions, um, again, continent-wide volcanism, such as we have not seen, um, our species has not seen at all. And just massive, massive, massive volcanism over hundreds of thousands, even millions of years. Okay, you have some of the survivors, and then you see what's happening in the oceans as well. Again, volcanism, and then just showing some of the marine life that's existing. Now, I should point out that the Permian was really cool because the Permian was when even these guys, what we have here, um, which are the, um, in fact, I think I have it on the next slide. Yeah, I had it on the next slide. So you have the mammal-like reptiles uh, ruling the um, land on the Permian. The ancestors of modern mammals were the dominant species on the planet during the Permian. So you had things like Gorgonopsids that were apex predators um, and they're mammal-like reptiles. You also had croc relatives um, and even um, you know, other reptile classes, but the mammal-like reptiles the, um, were the dominant organisms on land. 
after the, the end Permian and the Triassic, you still had some of these mammal-like reptiles, but the Triassic is this really weird assemblage of organisms. You have mammal-like reptiles, you have what are starting to look more like true mammals, even though I don't know if they are at that time. Um, but the dominant apex predator were these croc relatives, these pseudosuchians, um, and they were crocodiles that ran on land and were acted more like a dinosaur than a crocodile. Um, so if you imagine like, um, I don't know, Velociraptor or T-Rex as a crocodile instead of as a dinosaur, they were probably super terrifying. You have the first flying reptiles on the planet, the first flying um, um, vertebrates on the planet, and then the dinosaurs started to evolve as well. But for most of the Triassic, the dinosaurs weren't actually that comp um, that uh, diverse. It was mostly the um, the Pseudosuchians and the other croc-like um, or the other croc relatives that were dominant predators, as well as filling all kinds of other niches. Like you had herbivorous crocodiles at this time. It was a really weird time period. And then we get to the end Triassic, so really about 50 million years. Um, so we get we recover from the Great Dying, we recover from the end Permian, and then we only have about 50 million years until the end Triassic, when about 80% of species go extinct. The mechanism was also massive volcanism, but this massive volcanism was occurring through the mid-oceanic ridge, where you have, if I can trace it on this map, where you have North America separating from um, Europe and North America separating from uh, Africa, and then later South America separating as well, but really it's mostly this um, section of North America separating from Eurasia and Africa, where there was this massive amount of volcanism along that divergent plate boundary. Um, basically all the same stuff that happened with the end Permian happened again, but not quite as bad. And you go from this very um, strange assemblage of mammal-like reptiles, um, almost true mammals, um, all these really diverse croc relatives, and then dinosaurs just emerging to planet that's ruled by dinosaurs in the Jurassic, and the dinosaurs rule for the Jurassic and into the Cretaceous. And when I say rule, what I really mean is that they're the most dominant um, group of organisms, at least on land, until we get to the end Cretaceous max extinction. Um, this, hap this occurred about 66, 65 million years ago. Um, we're still honing in that date. I believe that I've seen it ranges from like 66.2 to um, about 65.4 or something like that. Doesn't really matter. About 66 million years ago. About three quarters of the species on the planet went extinct. The mechanism is both of these things happening at the same time, but First, you had flood basalt volcanism and the Deccan Traps in India. India is down attached to Madagascar. So that smaller island there is Madagascar, or that smaller chunk that will become an island is Madagascar, and then India um, attached to it. And India is on its way north, so it can collide with Asia much later. And you have massive volcanism on um, India known as the Deccan Traps and very similar to the Siberian Traps, you're releasing tons of CO2 and you're releasing sulfur dioxide from that volcanism. You're gonna have a short period of global cooling from that sulfur um, dioxide that's going into the planet, but then um, the warming effect from the CO2 is kicking in and you're gonna have this long period of global warming and ocean acidification after that initial very short cooling event. And as the Deccan Traps are going off, you have this asteroid that strikes around the Yucatan Peninsula um, and what is now Mexico. And that asteroid was about estimated to be about six to nine miles in diameter. Um, and it creates the Chicxulub cr um, Crater, which is 115 miles wide. That asteroid was traveling at 20 to 40 kilometers per second. So traveling faster than a bullet um, a hunk of rock six to nine miles in diameter traveling faster than a bullet. In fact, 20 times faster than a bullet. Okay, so these quotes are taken from um, the book The Ends of the World by Peter Brannon. Um, they're not exactly quotes, but I'm just paraphrasing. So a rock larger than Mount Everest struck the earth 20 times faster than a bullet. It would have been traveling so fast that it 
it went from the cruising altitude of a 747 to the ground in 0.3 seconds, 0 0.3 seconds. And so large that even at the moment of impact, the top of it would have been a mile above the cruising altitude of that 747. Okay, so imagine that you're in an airplane, that altitude, going from that altitude to the ground in 0.3 seconds, plus that top of that rock would be in a mile above it at the same time. And it was so large and moving so fast, and it had so much energy that it squeezed the atmosphere in front of it, and that created tremendous pressure. The air in front of it would have briefly become several times hotter than the surface of the sun, and that air, air, started to excavate the crater before the asteroid even hit it. Now we're talking microseconds if that was happening, but that's just insane for me to think about air being pushed by this piece of rock, by this asteroid, excavating a crater. So it's really, really crazy. And then that um, crater impact, or sorry, that asteroid impact is going to do a lot of things to the planet. It's going to kick up all this debris up into the atmosphere. It's going to create these massive tidal waves that are felt all the way um, all around the young Atlantic Ocean. You have these really cool fossil assemblies up in um, North America that are all the result of, um, of the tsunamis that occurred, and they're just like devastating tsunamis. You have... Um, a, you have asteroid uh, winter, essentially like nuclear winter. Um, so there's so much debris kicked up in the atmosphere that it stays up in the atmosphere for years at a time, blocking out the sun, stopping photosynthesis, killing most plants, um, killing all large herbivores, and then killing the smaller herbivores. At first, the carnivores have a field day. The carnivores get to feast on all this dead um, herbivores, but then they too uh, they, they start to lose, uh, run out of food, so they start eating each other, and then they just run out of food, and the last ones starve to death. Plus, you have all this volcanic ash and um, and material from the from that were that was blown up from the crater, raining down all on the planet. You have tiny little glass beads, um, you know, glass beads like the the sand from the earth that was turned into glass from the energy of this this um, asteroid raining down and so hot that it's starting wildfires it would just you know punch right through um, anything alive um, you know raining down with with a lot of energy and just so hot that it would just be like burning glass raining down from the from the sky um, organisms were choking to death uh, from the from all the dust and the ash, all of that stuff happening. And then you have the deck and traps kicking into overdrive because the earth is basically ringing like a bell after that asteroid impact. And that ringing causes those volcanoes to spew even more um, material into the air. And um, that, that volcanism goes off even faster and more aggressive. So really, really, um, terrible set of events that you have this volcanism occurring at the same time as the asteroid impact. Um, but it's actually really fortunate that the asteroid impact happened in water because if it happened on land, it might have been um, much worse. So again, some artist renditions um, of the asteroid itself, of the tsunamis afterwards, or like in, almost immediately after, and then the worldwide wildfires that are occurring due to the raining down of all that debris. And this is showing a bird that is going to survive. So a few animal groups survive, um, mammals, birds, crocodiles, snakes, lizards, etc. cetera, um, at least on land, and then you have everything in the oceans. Um, that survived, not, not, not the ones that went extinct. Quite a few things went extinct, a lot actually. Um, but on land at least, they think that birds, that small seed-eating birds, seed-eating birds were the ones that survived because they um, could take cover and that they were just picking through um, the underbrush looking for seeds, whereas something that's larger and needs either fruit or um, leaves or, uh, or meat would went extinct. Same thing, very similar with the mammals. They could burrow and that they could um, kind of go through the worst of it and, you know, come up to, to feed on just uh, seeds and debris. And you guys probably know this one, but dinosaurs gives way, gives way to the age of the mammals and the birds. Um, and then we lose a lot of diversity in the oceans. Uh, we lose the large... Um, um, amniotes, no, not amniotes, geez, um, 
the Nautilus relatives, I'm blanking on, on what they're called. We lose the Mosasaurs, we lose um, a lot of really, really interesting creatures in the, in the seas. And life was pretty good for about 66 million years until um, a large-brained primate arrived on the scene and potentially started causing the sixth mass extinction. Um, this is very debatable, but some um, authors are saying that we are leaving the Holocene and entering into the Anthropocene. And I'm going to use this term Anthropocene because I think that we are. So Anthropo basically means human and then seen as um, time, I guess. Um, that, that's, yeah, that's good enough for right now. Um, so the Holocene extinction or the Anthropocene extinction, and this is resulting from human activity. Again, we have this acronym HIPCO, so resulting from habitat loss, invasive species, human population growth, po uh, pollution, climate change, and overexploitation. And even if we were just looking at um, prehistoric times, we have what we call the um, overkill hypothesis. So if you read anything about why the mammoths and the mastodons and the saber-toothed cats and the cave lions um, and the short-faced bears, or sorry, American lions and short-faced bears and all this American um, megafauna species uh, went extinct at the end of the Pleistocene, some authors will suggest that's due to the overkill hypothesis or overhunting. And what that's, that's reflected up here on this diagram. And it's basically saying that I'm going to stick with North America, but then I'll talk about the other ones. Um, diversity is very high, so percent survival of large mammal species. So large mammal species is defined as anything over 100 pounds, uh, might be 50 pounds, sorry, 50 pounds, um, kilograms. I think it's 50 kilograms, whatever, large mammals. Um, you have very high survival rate until humans arrive on the scene and then they plummet. And you see that in Australia. Humans arrive on the scene before they arrive in North America, and a few thousand years later, they plummet. We went, I, we drove, potentially drove um, many of those species, the giant kangaroos, the giant wombats, the giant lizards, um, larger than Komodo dragons that were on Australia to extinction. And then the same thing happening on Madagascar, where we lose the large lemurs um, and drive those into extinction as well. Now, the outlier for this and what I think is the best argument or the best um, argument for this is what happens in Africa. Humans arrive on the scene and we barely cause any change at all. Why is that? Because the organisms, this, the animals that um, lived on Africa evolved with ancestral um, hominid species and co-evolved with those species. So as humans move, or sorry, as the human lineage um, the ancestral human lineage moved from a more vegetarian and arboreal lifestyle, meaning in the trees, to a more plains, um, upright walking and hunting lifestyle. The, um, the game animals and the predators, even the herbivores and the carnivores, were able to uh, co-adapt with us and change their behavior and as we evolved as well, right, through all of the stages of, um, our, uh, our, our, sorry, um, our, I, geez, I can't even say Australopithecus um, into um, all, all the hominid species, etc. Uh, they were able to co-evolve and adapt to human um, presence, whereas Homo sapiens just, you know, show up on Australia and bam, you have massive loss. Show up on North America, bam, you have a massive loss. And then show up on Madagascar, bam, massive loss a few thousand years later. Now, there is also the climate argument for this. So, the climate did change, especially for the North American one, um, very drastically. But many of these um, many of these species had survived all of the different um, all of the previous ups and downs of um, of global temperature and global sea level rise and fall and ice ages um, and interglacials occurring for hundreds of thousands of years and a couple million years even. Okay, so I would include. Um, the extinction of the megafauna at the end of the Pleistocene as part of the sixth mass extinction and the current rate of extinction is 100 to 1,000 times higher than the background extinction rate. Some authors even say up to 10,000 times higher. Okay. So just to illustrate that point, um, there are 
few di I, like the diagram and a few images up on this slide. But habitat degradation, habitat loss, is the primary driver for most of the extinctions of um, of species, except for marine species. Okay, um, if we think about that, we would think about something like this happening: conversion of all of this what was once probably tropical rainforest into farmland. Okay, creating these little islands of um, tiny patches of rainforest in this sea of farmland. All right, this looks like they're losing over 80% of their habitat, right? Um, pollution, meh, it's happening and it's definitely not good, but not really causing species to go extinct. Same thing with invasive species and disease, definitely a contributing factor, especially for amphibians. Um, I really thought that this would be higher when I first saw this diagram, especially the chytrid fungus with frogs. Uh, climate change, definitely a problem, but exploitation, which is what I'm showing here. And notice what's happening with the fish and then with the mammals with over-exploitation. The reason that I have the corals bleaching, that's climate change. Okay, That's due to high temperatures in the ocean. The corals get stressed with high temperature, kick out their symbiotic algae, which gives them their color, and then without the photosynthetic algae, they quickly die. So one thing that I said at the very beginning of this is that I think that the past is the key to understand what's going to happen in the present or the future. And that's what we're seeing here. So the um, comparing the end Triassic to what's happening today. And I'll let you pause this and just take that in for a moment, read through this. And then um, I found this, di I, this article, um, Son et al., and I liked this diagram from it. So this is showing extinction rates in red, the temperature change in this kind of greenish color, and then the rate of temperature change. So rate of temperature change in degrees Celsius per million years um, in this blue color. And what we see is that as the temperature changes, um, we don't necessarily get extinction events but it's the rate of temperature change that really aligns very well with um, mass extinction events. The temperature change definitely does also because temperature change is more or less dependent on rate of temperature change as well, but um, the, t the rate of temperature change is really what's key for mass extinctions because it doesn't give those species enough time to evolve to that temperature change. So this has implications for um, nowadays. And I just want to read you guys this abstract um, from this um, article. Climate change is a critical factor affecting biodiversity. However, the qu quantitative relationship between temperature change and extinction is unclear, which is why they did this study. Here we analyze magnitudes and rates of temperature change and extinction rates of marine fossils through the past 450 million years. The results show that both the rate and magnitude of temperature change are significantly positively correlated with the extinction rate of marine animals. So that's what I just kind of explained, although I focused on the rate and they just talked about both of them. Um, major mass extinctions in the Phanerozoic can be linked to thresholds in climate change, warming, or cooling that equate to magnitudes of greater than 5.2 degrees Celsius and rates of over 10 um, degrees Celsius per million of years. So if we think about one of the projections for, um, for our current state of global warming is about five degrees Celsius, um, worst case scenario, five degrees Celsius by 2100. That is a huge change um, in just a century, two centuries, okay? We're not even talking about millions of years. We're talking about a century. So that is a very fast rate. The significant relationship between temperature change and extinction still exists when we exclude the five largest mass extinctions in the Phanerozoic and then their conclusions. Our findings predict that a temperature increase of 5.2 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial level at present rates of increase would likely result in mass extinction comparable to that of the major Phanerozoic events, even without other non-climatic anthrop anthropogen anthropogenic activities, or sorry, impacts. That would be stuff like um, habitat loss, human population growth, invasive species, and over-exploitation, right? Everything but the sea and HIPCO. Okay, all of this is happening as well. Plus we have the climate effect that is the ticking time bomb um, about to go off. Okay, so if we think back to all of those big five over 
two thirds of species loss on the planet. And that's what Son et al. are arguing um, and using data to back that up. So enough doom and gloom, let's talk about what happens after mass extinction because life will find a way. Life always will find a way. None of these extinction events, even the end Permian, eliminated animal life. So what happens afterwards? Afterwards, you have this recovery period um, where there is very few taxa and low diversity. The dominant species are typically generalists that can survive the stress. They're what we call disaster species. Then we get to the rebound phase. So we have this massive increase in um, the rate of evolution. We have um, adaptive radiation typically, which is what I'm discussing down here. Um, new species evolve to fill those open niches and getting into the recovery interval where we have rapid diversification. And life is going to go on, but the problem is, is that we have greatly reduced phylogenetic diversity. For example, we don't have any of the really cool um, lineages that existed in the past, whether that is um, things like uh, the thylacine or pterosaurs, any of the dinosaurs, mosasaurs, um, gorgonopsids, any of the really cool species that we had in the past, we have lost them and they're never going to come back. So we have greatly reduced phylogenetic diversity. Essentially what you are doing is taking a tree of life and you are pruning it to where you only have maybe a few survivors. Okay. Think about all the diversity of all the dinosaurs on the planet and think about just the birds surviving through that. So we reduce that phylogenetic diversity hugely. Phylogenetic diversity, um, also um, genetic diversity. Okay. So what I mean by phylogenetic diversity is uh, genetic diversity, rather a type of genetic diversity. Okay. So back to the learning objectives. Um, this video is getting long enough. I'm not going to go through these again. I'll see you guys later. Enjoy your day. Bye.